We are sitting here with Scott Lynn, founder and CEO of Masterworks. Uh, I was looking today. We talked to you the first time, April of 2020. It feels like four years ago. And <laughs> I think we want to get into a bunch of stuff about how the art market has changed and handled COVID and all this stuff. And I think that the biggest change in that time in the art world is the fact that we now have these NFTs. Um, wanted to get your take. What is the company line for Masterworks on NFTs and how do you think about those as they fit into the art world? Yeah, it's a great, I mean, it's a great question. It's a, uh, it's a tough question to kick it off with, but um, yeah, <laughs> you know, I, I, I would say that broadly speaking, we don't view NFTs as investments um, and that's a little bit of a controversial topic. So let me, let me take a step back and explain why, why we, why we feel that way. Um, so one of the things we talk a lot about in the art market is scarcity and how does scarcity of a painting impact the value of that painting uh, over time. And one of the things that, that we struggle with with NFTs is the, the argument behind an NFT is essentially taking a digital image, putting it on blockchain and claiming that there's scarcity value because it's on blockchain. And I think the very technical trip up we have with that is that when you take a digital image and you put it on blockchain, you're not actually transferring any copyright or IP. So I own that digital image just as much as the person that owns that token owns that digital image. And therefore we, we don't view it as an investment. So you don't think that NFTs are coming to the Masterworks platform anytime soon? <laughs> I, l luckily, I, uh, I know that NFTs are not coming to the Masterworks platform anytime soon. <laughs> okay, I'm just curious, how does that conversation happen internally when this stuff comes out and you see these digital artists and it's making so much news? How does that conversation come to fore with your, your leadership team? Well, how look, about spe I, I think specifically, we, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I, I, I think we fundamentally view ourselves as an asset manager in that anything we bring to the platform, we want to have conviction that that, that asset class in, in the case, you know, of, of, of um, our business today, which is real physical, tangible art is appreciating over time. And just because NFTs are setting price records momentarily, and I think we've seen NFT prices come down since we, we first took this position, um, that doesn't necessarily mean they're, they're investments, right? It doesn't necessarily mean that people can earn consistent positive returns over time. What did you think as a lover of art when Banksy burned the painting <laughs> and, then, and then the NFT sold for it? I don't know how many multiples of what the art piece of physical art was worth. I'm sure that uh, that must have been a day. Yeah, I mean, look, you, you know, again, I, I guess when we think about the art market, we use this term a lot called cultural significance. And to us, cultural significance means what museums or institutions collect which artists, what artists do do uh, does that specific artist exhibit with who are important, and then how global is the demand. I think a lot of people in the art world have been scratching their heads saying, you know, what, what is the cultural significance of these, these digital images? And I think a lot of people in the crypto community would say, hey, the cultural significance is blockchain. But to us, that's, that's really a distribution mechanism. It's not really in itself cultural significance. So, I, you know, I think we've had lots of conversations about NFTs with people. I think we just fundamentally fail to understand how they meet any criteria for what we, we would expect of any strategic asset class. So one of one of the things that Masterworks has done so well is really bring data to the forefront in the art market. City has a great report. It's, uh, it's pretty long. We'll link to this in the show notes. A lot of great charts in there. And maybe a, a good place to kick off this conversation is uh, a chart that shows blue chip art. So artworks that are $500,000 or more versus developed equities. This goes all the way back to 1985. And some pretty decent outperformance from art versus global equities. And I guess a, a, a new boil question is, uh, why does the value of art go up over time? Yeah, it's a great, it's a great question. And we, we get this question a lot. So if you, um, to, to your point, Masterworks has the leading research team in the art market today. We're the only research team that analyzes returns. Um, we, we basically now have working relationships with every major private bank uh, where our research team is helping their research team get up to speed on the asset class, uh, as well as institutions. And, you know, there, the, the, there's often this question of what causes art prices to go up? 
If you look at returns from post-World War II uh, through today, the art market has, has outperformed most other asset classes. Um, we talk a lot about returns from 1995 through present, which are roughly 14% per year for all art uh, created after World War II during that, that period of time. Um, it's, you know, it's, an, it's a very interesting asset class. I think generally we think there's two things that cause art prices to increase. One is art prices are probably correlated to wealth creation of the top 1% on a global basis. So the wealthier people get around the world, generally we believe that, that art prices are correlated to that. Uh, the second thing, which, which is very obvious but, but interesting, is scarcity. So when an, artist, uh, when an artist is alive and they paint different paintings, and I like to use Jackson Pollock as an, as an example of this, um, they eventually pass away and then those paintings get donated to museums over time, decreasing supply in the artist's body of work. So Jackson Pollock, uh, when he was alive, painted, you know, hundreds of, um, of drip paintings, which, which many people are familiar with um, his work. Today, I think there's 21 or 22 drip paintings left in private collections. All of those 21 or 22, except for a couple, are B or C examples, right? It, when he was living, most people would have said those are not, those are not great Jackson Pollocks. They still sell for 20 to $40 million because if you want to own a Jackson Pollock, that's, that's all that's left. So art is one of the only asset classes that actually decreases in supply over time. And if you take a step back and think about that, you know, every, every day there's more businesses started, there's more homes built, there's more gold mined. Most asset classes are increasing in supply over time. So this is one of the very few that, that shrinks over time. When, when we talked to you last, we were still in the throes of the beginning of the uh, pandemic and we didn't really know what was gonna happen with the financial markets. How did the art market do last year? Was there a huge disruption to auctions? Did things come offline for a while? How did performance work? How did how did art make out last year through the pandemic? Yeah, so this this was uh, you know this was kind of a uh, it, it was an interesting time for us because in December of 2019 we had partnered with City and published this 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 report that basically said art is an uncorrelated asset class to the S and P as well as other asset classes, meaning that if if financial markets go down, art prices should not necessarily go down, go down with them. And, uh, you know, we published that report in December, 2019, and then COVID happens and we're like, uh, you know, I hope, I hope our research was true. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and luckily, uh, you know, the, the research played out, which it showed that our prices continue to go up throughout COVID. I, I can't recall what month it was. I think it was April, May, June, right in there, probably the last time I was on the show. Uh, I think over a dozen artists set price records right in the middle of covid um yeah so we you know we saw our prices continue to increase last year despite the uh the volatility in the markets so in the in the first seven months there's this really neat chart that city put together in the first seven months of 2020 uh the art market outperformed every other major asset class so all art did five and a half percent contemporary art did 6.7 percent obviously we know what happened to equities so this is a dumb question but i'm asking anyway is art recession proof and well, I guess that's, it fell 21.6% in the GFC. So obviously the answer is no, but I mean, going forward, I don't want to say that art is like a play on, on wealth inequality, because that sounds kind of gross. Um, but wealthy people have so much money that it almost seems like, I, I don't, nothing's recession proof, but it weathered this recession pretty well because rich people or mega rich people were largely unaffected by, by, by COVID the way that the rest of the uh, economy was. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, one of the, one of the things that was was very interesting about COVID is it was actually a global crisis to a certain extent. So typically in the art market, you know, a quarter of the art market today is the U.S., a quarter is Western Europe, a quarter is China, and then a quarter of rest is rest of the world. So typically, when you when you have country specific issues, it doesn't affect the art market overall, right? I can I can buy a twenty million dollar basket out of New York, I can put it on a plane, and I can fly it to Hong Kong and sell it. So we tend to describe art as a as a currency neutral asset, um, but yeah, I mean, I mean, the art the art market was was not affected um, nearly nearly as much as as other asset classes during that time. You in your report, you have this this really cool chart that shows the different the, the sort of the size opportunity for art, and you show private real assets and art and private equity and gold and public equities and all this stuff, and you show how ultra high net worth investors have 
you know, it, it's a $1.7 trillion market, but ultra high net worth investors have 5% of portfolios in it and institutions have basically none. Are there any institutions that are starting to get interested in this space? Or do you think that it's just, it's too different of a market for them to ever really meaningfully come in here and, and put their dollars to work? You know, it's it's been fascinating. So in the past, I would say six to 12 months, we've seen institutions actually come to the Masterworks website and and either you know work work with us manually or or, or buy securities through the website to add them to funds. Uh, in particular, we're seeing we're seeing a lot of managers buy securities for real asset strategies, managers that are concerned about inflation, um, and that's a dynamic that that we've we've never seen before. And, and you know we're we're not macro people like internally. I think we we don't know how to think about inflation, but we definitely see a lot of sophisticated investors that are that are concerned about it. So, so they. What is the assumption that art would be a good inflation hedge? It's a it's a real asset. Okay. So any you know theoretically any real asset in an inflationary environment would move up in price. Um, so that so the thought is that art art could could act as a hedge against other asset classes that that don't like fixed income. There's this really neat chart showing that more expensive paintings have done much better, which I guess makes sense because a there are fewer of them um they're worth more and maybe so so how does something like masterworks does the dynamic of unlocking the technology change the nature of how this market might function going forward yeah there's two there's two important points there that i that i that i, I you know i think i can respond to so the first is you know the company is named masterworks because of the slide that you're referencing like we fundamentally believe the most investable segment of the art market are paintings roughly a million dollars and above. Um, if you look at the risk adjusted returns of anything less than a million dollars, you tend to get paintings that are that are just, yeah, I mean, people bought something for $10,000 and they sold it for a million dollars and they got a huge return. But the predictability of that investment is, is just effectively unpredictable. It's like buying a lottery ticket. Um, so we we think the the, the best risk adjusted adjusted segment of the market is a million dollars and up. Um, how big is that again, opportunity? The, how, how, the, oh, the second point: How does technology change the art market? So when when we think about masterworks, we think of this as an asset class first play. Meaning we don't care if we raise money through a website or if we raise money through um, third party vehicles that are sold to to the managed money community. It doesn't really matter how how we raise capital. But this year, we, we will raise three to $400 million that is going into the art market that wasn't there before. So we're really bringing a new, a new source of capital to the art market. Um, and you, you can see parallels between the art market today, which is really just this community of ultra high net worth investors trading $10 million paintings between each other, and maybe Bitcoin many years ago, where there was no institutional capital in that market whatsoever. Um, you know, I think I think in a world where we see billions of dollars flow into the art market from institutions or non-individuals, you could see prices of art go up significantly. So, well, because you you're you're bringing you're bringing a new buyer to the market that didn't exist. So, people like Ben and I, I'm I don't have a million dollars to buy a painting with, but I've got five thousand dollars to diversify and buy a bunch of different paintings with. Yeah. So, uh, what sort of opportunity set are we talking about here? How many million dollar paintings are there in the world? Well, so so this year, I guess, you know, in a normal non-COVID year, roughly $60 billion a year in art changes hands. Wow. Um, the asset class is estimated to be $1.7 trillion in size. So think of it as a couple percent turnover every year. Um, so it's a massive, massive asset class, right? Like we, we, we can raise billions and billions of dollars um, into this market so, to purchase uh, art. I, I like thinking of the demographics of this space. So you, the Citigroup also has a piece where it talks about under 40 art buyers at, so at Sotheby's and it talks about how it's that group makes up 25% of online bidders versus 15% of live bidders. Is there this new group of young, rich people that are coming into this space that were never really there before as another segment of this of these buyers? You know, so with the Beeple sale, we, uh, we learned, I think that day, and I think this is, I, I've made this comment to different media sources now, so I think it's out there. I think we learned that there were, there were 30, uh, 30 bidders who had signed up to bid uh, on that NFT that were totally unknown to Christie's. And in the art world, this never happens, right? You, you, show, you, you show up to an auction for a, whatever, $10 million plus painting. It's a small the auction world. house knows every single person bidding on that painting. They know everything about them. Yeah. Um, so this was the first time that the auction house had this, this flood of totally new collectors who are willing to spend 
don't know if they're willing to spend $10 million, they're willing to spend $60, but you know, some number in between there on, on this NFT. Um, what we did see from that is that a couple of those collectors we've heard have now started buying what I would define as real art, uh, physical art, um, after that, that sale. So we, you know, I think we are seeing some of those, those crypto people come into the art market and, and participate unlike before. So in the, in that city report, they said that, uh, art and collectibles were, uh, on, uh, digital were $4.8 billion in 2019 or just 7.5% of global sales. And they expected growth rates only in the single digits. So art is traditionally very much an in-person thing. Uh, it's a small world, but COVID turned the entire world upside down, obviously art included. So last year, Sotheby's did $363 million in a live stream auction over the summer, and uh, they sold 93% of their inventory. So pretty successful. Then Christie's followed that up. They did $420 million. So are they planning on a return to an in-person only? Are digital auctions here to stay? Or are they doing like some sort of combination where they have people that, are, that want to visit and be physical and, and see the art, and as well as people online bidding? You know, I think it's I think it's all of the above. So we're we're seeing a lot of younger new collectors go to auction houses and buy things like sneakers, which is never you know that market's never really existed before. So that's that's brand new. Um, but I think if you if you speak to a lot of mega dealers in today's world, they would say the one thing that's really negatively impacted their business is the ability to put someone in front of a painting and sell them on it, meaning. If you're buying things online, you can transact online as long as the collector knows what they want to buy. They know the artist, they know the work. It just so happens to be there. They've always wanted it, they buy it. But it's very hard to actually sell someone on a new artist, an expensive painting without being in person, particularly if it's a $10 million painting. Did you see Uncut Gems? No. Uh, there's, a, there's an art scene in there where KG uh, gets outbid. But anyway, that's neither, that's neither here nor there. <laughs> Um, it, do, you, do you have any idea about the sense of the number of young people coming to your platform? Do you guys have an idea about the demographics there? Is it way more young people or is it kind of across the board? You know, it's really across the board. So I think, you know, our average investor now is investing somewhere around thirty-five dollars to $40,000 over their lifetime. Um, so we, you know, we definitely don't have the, uh, you know, the $200 type, what I would describe as kind of an NFT investor. Um, most of our investors are more sophisticated. They're looking for an uncorrelated return stream. Some today are concerned about inflation. Uh, some are simply looking to outperform public equities or other asset classes that they, they allocate to. Um, but you know, they, they, I describe them as massive flow, right? They're people who drive BMWs and Mercedes. They're, they're not necessarily whatever qualified purchasers, the $5 million net worth, but they're, you know, they're, they're successful professionals. How uh, many paintings do you have on the platform? You know, I think now we're up to uh, mid fifties. So these are all paintings between one and fifteen million dollars. Um, you know, AUM now I think is is somewhere around one hundred and fifty. Do you have any artists out there that you especially would like to get on your platform? And you say, okay, we got this now. Like we really made it. Or do you just is it more of a cost benefit thing? Of no, this is a good value, and we stick with whatever value we can get. Well, so we, the way that we think about buying a painting, um, maybe to walk through our investment process is we, we have this research team, which we talked about, which is the leading research team in understanding returns in the art market. Um, that team's sole responsibility is really deciding what artist markets to go into uh, or what sub artist markets to go into. For example, Picasso is the largest artist there is with the roughly 13% of total, total market volume. Uh, but Picasso has a lot of sub markets, different periods in which he painted um, which performed differently than, than his market overall. So that team today has decided that there's 45 artist markets that we should focus on. And then we hand those, that artist list effectively off to our acquisitions team that goes out and finds examples by those artists. So I think now we have 2,400 different, 2,500 different works that have been offered to us by those 45 different artists. We're buying one to 2% of what we see. Oh wow! Um, so it's a pretty, yeah, it's a pretty disciplined process. Um, How much of what, that is for, for auctions versus private art collectors that are coming to you? Is it a good mix? Yeah, there's three different categories, right? So one is dealing with collectors directly, um, and you know, I would say 25% of our business is is working with collectors directly. Uh, one is working through 
private sources, either advisors or galleries that are doing private sales, and then and then one is public auction. You know, we're we're buying less and less through public auction. Um, you know, we're probably mainly now working with with direct collectors and and kind of private intermediaries. So you said one to two percent. Uh you're you're actually buying is that because it's overpriced it's not in great condition it's not the right artist or the right painting like what is it about those one to two percent that you're like we'll take it yeah it's it's really two things so one is is the is the imagery or is the example representative of what you think of when you think of that artist so you you know you want to buy an artist's most iconic representative imagery generally so when someone sees that painting on the wall they're like oh that's a that's a jackson pollock um and then the second thing is just price, right? We're 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 pretty value oriented just because we see we see so much work. So are you How, taking are you taking a piece of the equity? Like in other words, do you have do you have skin in the game that way to make sure that you're not overpaying? Yeah, we we earn over our management fees and equity. So the the one and a half percent that we earn every year is paid to us by uh, issuing us shares in the vehicle, and then we have twenty percent carry or twenty percent profit when the paint uh. sells. All yeah, right. so we we you know we totally have have skin in the game, and that's that's where our profit comes from. And how does the sales process work? I know you guys probably haven't sold a lot, but I think at least on the website it says you guys took an offer for a bank seal. How does that work when you guys get an offer on this on the something that you already own? Yeah, so that you know the bank team market's been a crazy market over the past eighteen months. Um, our our research team identified him as having momentum a couple of years ago, and we started focusing on his market and really really acquiring um, works by him. You know that that was a rare example where we bought this this Banksy Mona Lisa painting, um, uh, and and sold it exactly one year later for a thirty two percent return net of fees to investors. Um, so that was a I think that was a great great deal for everyone. Um, yeah, because so yeah, I mean when, the typical holding period is probably going to be what five to seven years for someone on something like this ten years potentially. Yeah, we tell people to think of these as three to ten year illiquid holds. Uh, since I since I was on last time, one of the things that you know we were talking about when we uh, before the show was we we have launched secondary markets, so people are now trading shares in these securities as well, um, and those are those are continuous trading markets where uh, they're on all the time. Um, but yeah, we're seeing we're seeing more and more investors open trading accounts. I think we're up to. I want to say seven or eight thousand investors with trading accounts today. So I, I actually was poking around there. And I like that you can somebody can list their shares for whatever twenty three bucks, and you could counter. I thought I thought that was really neat. So I was poking around the secondary marketplace, and I clicked on a form one k, um, and the underwriting fees on a Banksy piece were call it like one point three percent of proceeds. Who is Independent Brokerage Solution, and, and what do those fees exactly cover? Um, so that, you know, so that's actually a confusing, um, that's a confusing thing that you're looking at. So those are the way, the way some of that language is written is there's, there's certain FINRA requirements where you have to say that there's fees up to a certain amount for, um, our third party broker dealer. Those really are just internal, uh, sales expenses for, for our sales team. It's a bit of a regulatory requirement, but those, those aren't actually fees that are being passed on to investors. Those are just disclosure requirements. Actually, so that's, that's a good answer because I saw those fees and then I saw, but but wait a minute, they weren't actually deducted. So yeah, yeah, yeah. those are those. Yeah, it's just a disclosure requirement. So this stuff in the secondary market, so this stuff is trading pretty frequently. Then yeah, it's trading. It's trading continuously. So we're really the only the only platform out there where there's not any type of trading window whatsoever. Um, you know, we we tell investors to think about the secondary market as is having limited liquidity, right? Like if you want to get out of your position, you can list. A fair price for the shares and get out in one to two weeks, um, but you know it's it's there for people who who want to use it. Uh, have you guys ever sold a painting for a loss? No. Um, so I, do you think that do you think it's possible that you would? You know, it's interesting. So when you look at one of the things our research team analyzes is loss rates uh, in the asset class. And if you look at loss rates uh, on a two-year, three-year trailing average compared to S&P, real estate, gold, um, I think we've looked at a few other asset classes as well, loss rates for art tend to be the lowest. And then when there is a loss, the magnitude of loss also tends to be the lowest. And I think that's really interesting. I mean, one thing that you, you might be seeing in that data is just that if you're an ultra high net worth person and you're buying a Monet for $10 million, and markets change dramatically, you're not really interested in selling it for 5 million. 
And we, you know, we, we just don't, we don't really see that in the data. I mean, we see people buying things for $10 million and selling them for 9.5 million, but we don't, we don't really see significant losses uh, in the art market compared to other asset classes. I could see that. So the other thing that you've added, I think, and I've looking at this in recent months, I'm looking at my portfolio of holdings here is just you're doing an estimated fair value now, which uh, I believe is relatively new. And so how, how does that pricing work and how often do you guys do that update? Yeah, so we, we, do, we do quarterly appraisals. Um, you know, as we mentioned, these are kind of three to 10 year holds. So I think those appraisals in the first couple of years are not necessarily in, indicative of what, you know, how value is, is trending. Um, but yeah, I mean, in, investors are, are using those now in particular with the secondary market to think about how they trade in and out of securities based on, on appraised value. What is the most expensive painting that you guys have bought? Uh, I think it is not yet announced. I, these paintings, there's, <laughs> there's so many of them now. I think we bought 70 or $80 million of art in the last two weeks. Um, you know, I believe it was a, uh, a 12 or $13 million uh, Basquiat was the last one that we announced that was an expensive painting. We have a we have a, uh, a Richter live on the platform now. That's a, uh, I believe it's a ten million dollar offering. Uh, I think there's a ten or eleven million dollar Basquiat on now. So we're kind of you know I would say our sweet spot now is between five and ten million dollars, moving up to fifteen million dollars, and we're really trying to stay away from artists that have paintings less than a million dollars, just because it doesn't it's not that effective with our cost structure. And it seems like from the website and getting the emails, updates from you guys, I don't know, there's probably one painting on average every week or two. Is that about right? Yeah, it's almost exactly right. I think, I think we're launching one painting every, every 10 days right now. And how quickly are those? It seems like they fill up relatively quick. Like you have to, if you want to make that decision, you got to do it pretty quick. Is it a couple of days that these sell out in a day? Yeah, I mean, a lot, a lot of our million dollar offerings, I think we, you know, we launched a uh, Gunter Ford painting last week, I believe. I think it sold out in like 36 hours. Um, everything, was, everything is oversubscribed. Well, it's not not technically oversubscribed. They're fixed price offerings, so we don't. You know, I just mean it. I just mean in general. Yeah, yeah. we've never. Yeah, we've never. We've never not raised. Uh, not raised enough capital for for an offering. Right. Yes. Yeah, so right you've never, now, you've never put a painting out there that's been like ninety percent full and that you can't get the last ten percent. That's never happened, right? Never happened. Yeah. Whether it's art or Pokemon cards, like everything is oversubscribed. Uh, right yeah. now, it's it's a, it's a pretty wild time. What happens if? Uh, the unfortunate event where you guys purchase a fake painting. I know that's like a, a mega issue in the art world. Do you have insurance for something like that? Yeah, you know, we. so I, I'm actually on the board of um, the International Foundation of Art Research, which is the leading art authenticity nonprofit. Um, so very familiar with, with authenticity issues. It, for the types of paintings we're buying, there's not really concerns around authenticity. They're, they're, the paintings are included in what's called a catalog resume, which is the recognized book of the of of art of the artist paintings that are regarded as authentic, they almost all have museum exhibition history. Um, they're kind of already written in history, so so to say. Um, so we you know we we don't really have concerns about authenticity at this segment of the market. It is a concern in the in the five or ten thousand dollar print segment, or you know if you're buying a Picasso napkin drawing, there's lots of concerns about about authenticity there, but not. not uh, I think. Blockchain fixes this, is what they would say. <laughs> <laughs> so I know yeah. you guys have actually sent out a few surveys asking client satisfaction and how and potential for other products like a, a fund. Like if someone just decided, I don't want to pick these myself and try to diversify myself, I would just rather put $10,000 in or something and have Masterworks diversify for me. Um, is that something that's a possibility in the future for you guys? Yeah, I mean, we're we're definitely still considering that. I think I think right now we're we're continuing to focus on these these single asset vehicles just because that's that's where the demand is. I mean, we we've effectively created this community of 140,000 people who've become very passionate about picking and choosing different artworks to invest in, trading them on the secondary platform. Um, we do think that's that that product is required over time. Uh, we're just not sure how to think about timing well, on that right now. As a consumer. Uh, uh, on the platform, I would be, I would much prefer a fund. So I have five different paintings. I can't tell you why I own any of them. I can tell you who Andy Warhol <laughs> is. <laughs> I can tell you who Andy Warhol is, but other than that, I don't think I know these artists. So I am in favor of, of uh, the fund for what it's worth. Yeah. And, and, I, and I think that's fair. I mean, the, the reality is it's just like public equities, right? Like we, we know that picking and choosing things, sometimes you can make suboptimal decisions. Um, index funds for most people can be, can be, uh, 
advantageous. I think we think similarly. Um, I'm just not sure if that's something we're going to get to right right away. Here's my uh, here's my request. I want a website where I can click and do a print of one of these these paintings that I buy, so I can hang on my wall and brag to people that I own. Uh, 0.5% of this or something, <laughs> right? So yeah. I can, I can show them off, right? Every I, uh, time I buy one, I'll hang a new one. Yeah, we, we get, uh, we get this request all the time. I mean, I, it's, it's, it's been on our priority list. We've got so many <laughs> priorities. It hasn't, uh, it hasn't made it to the top yet, but uh, it's definitely something that we, we want to do at some point. Well, Scott, congratulations on all your success and continued growth. And uh, we're happy customers. So thank you for coming on the show today. Awesome. Thanks guys.